So I have uh, six o'clock. I'd like to call the June 11, 2019 Governing Board of CV Fiber to order. Uh, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I'd like to just add, um, add in uh, discussing um, some insurance possibilities. I've been researching some stuff um, in regards to capital insurance. So I just Quite a word, sir. Can the people who speak tell us who they are? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't remember your name. I'm Josh Jarvis. Thank you. I, I, it would be helpful for me. I'm, I'm just a person, a people person, I guess. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Josh Jarvis. I represent uh, Barrytown. And I was just suggesting that we, that we add in um, just to discuss some capital insurance um, possibilities. OK. Um, yes. Um, I'm Becca Schrader. I'm a clerk and treasurer. Um, I would like to discuss the possibility of doing um, polls for interest for a new member orientation. Okay. That was uh, something I, I, I have I have heard about from a couple other folks. So I think we if we can talk about that maybe um, under the rules of procedure. Sure. Um, because that's something that we have to adopt every year. <coughs> New member orientation and do that under. Okay. Okay. Anything else? You in the, the comfy chair tonight, Phil? Not really. No? <laughs> oh. but, but like you're not really in the chair or it's not really comfy? You know, Alan kind of, you know, sold me the bill of goods on <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, fair enough. So, uh, public comment. Uh, any commentary on items that are not on the agenda? Uh, hearing none, um, uh, Washington Electric Co-op Fiber Feasibility Study. Um, looks like Barry is not here, but uh, Steve, if you're going to... Uh, can you, can I project anything on the screen? You sure can. Do you want me to do it from my Mac, or should I just give you a stick? Um, probably be best for you, do you have it? Um, looks like this is VGA only. Uh, or, or if you can eat... Yeah, what, if you want to try to give that to me, it's going to be a bit of a... I think it might have each. I've like got that much to say. Yeah. But, uh, Do you want to? So it's okay. so if you so we can come right over to the desk here if you want. So that with the adapter. <laughs> so you've got the. Uh, the other display. Yeah. Okay. 
to change it to this? Well, no, yeah, just, just it should be in your operating system to change to. Okay. Is it going to be this thing that's going to show up right now? Uh, one thing I can try to see is mine. I know, right? I don't know why. It's like 20 years. It's never. <laughs> Jeez, look at that. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Score. My name is Steve Nolton. I'm visiting from uh, Washington Electric Cooperative. Uh, I'm a board member there, and uh, our board chairman, uh, Barry Bernstein, is uh, sitting in the back. I'm here to give you an update of what uh, Washington Electric's um, um, basically the, our actions have been in pursuing broadband, uh, a broadband feasibility study. And so let's just go to the next slide. So uh, we have submitted um, an economic and infrastructure development grant to the Northern Border Regional Commission. These were due uh, about a month ago. Um, we asked for a total of $95,000. Uh, this includes uh, a request that required 35% match. Um, and we can talk more about that uh, in the future. And the idea is we're requesting support for to uh, do a feasibility study uh, and an identification of an appropriate uh, reliable business plan for broadband. And the three purposes that we have at WEC are listed at the bottom. Obviously, we need a fiber backbone or ring um, to our substations and going out beyond for operating the electric utility. Currently, we have a uh, power line control system and then uh, for readers and then uh, telephone lines to, uh, uh, to our substations. Uh, <clears throat> also, we'd like to expand our fiber communication ultimately to uh, for smart grid applications to serve our customers uh, in the whole state of Vermont in support of the uh, 2050 plan. And of course, the reason I'm here is to talk about internet and telecom for our members. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I just want to put this in perspective after more or less just telling you what, what we're up to. Uh, this map was provided to us by um, Mr. Healy. And uh, it shows, uh, it's a nice slide because it shows uh, WEC service territory, which is that sort of squash bug looking thing uh, superimposed on top of the WEC, uh, on top of the towns of central Vermont. Uh, and also includes, shows you where the various regions of CV fiber in the uh, light green, kingdom fiber in blue, and EC fiber in purple. So you can see that uh, there's an overlap um, between WEX service territory and a lot of uh, CV fibers uh, towns. Uh, but it's not a complete overlap. And if we go to the next slide, and here I just, I just uh, penciled in uh, WEX service territory and a map of Vermont. Many of you have probably seen this map before. If you haven't, I will... Um, I see. Could you just like, use your finger to go around the area? <clears throat> I will explain it. Yeah. Um, first of all, again, here's this. This outlines our service territory. <clears throat> this map is um, purports to show which areas in Vermont are eligible for um, USDA funding from their uh, from the RUS, the Rural Utility Service, and <clears throat> the hash marked areas are presumably areas that have already been served by USDA <laughs> and may not be uh, eligible for future grants. Uh, the dark blue are areas which are 
just basically unserved at what we would consider uh, reliable internet uh, speeds. And the um, uh, sort of this washed out blue, which you may or may not be able to see, uh, but there are regions here and here and here. Um, these represent areas which are, which are partially served. So you can see that a lot of WEX territory um, includes uh, areas largely in Orange County here, which are um, really uh, unserved. And anecdotally, we know um, from discussing with some of our own members that indeed this, this area in eastern Vermont really doesn't um, uh, have a lot of service uh, available to it at the present time. So let's go to the next slide, please. So <clears throat> just to update you with what we're up to right now, is we, we, now that we've submitted our proposal, uh, we're preparing uh, a request for proposals to, uh, to hire consultants to help us do the feasibility study uh, and uh, identify a reliable <coughs> business plan. <clears throat> Let me come back to the second point in a second. We're also present time assessing WEX, our own fiber backbone needs just to, uh, so we can run the, the electric operation. This would obviously be the backbone for, um, um, for the internet service that we provide or interact with uh, you know, the CDs like yourself. Um, but this is something we can, you know, we can do and are doing uh, as we speak. And um, <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned in the first slide, or first or second slide, um, we are um, uh, we need 35% matching funds, and so uh, we're presently uh, trying to lock in our uh, our matching funds. WEC is, of course, providing some of its own uh, money, especially uh, when it comes to sort of in-kind costs to supply person you know, pay for personnel who would be doing. Um, various aspects of the feasibility study that. and um, <clears throat> sorry about that. one of the things that's no problem one of the things that um, it strikes me uh, that we need to do relatively early on in the process is uh, assessing our members needs and expectations with regard to broadband service at various locations within our service territory uh, you may remember from that blue map some areas are served moderately okay, some not very well at all. And we don't really expect uh, an outside consultant necessarily to be able to provide the fine-grained advice uh, over what uh, take rates uh, might be uh, in various of our uh, localities. So uh, this is a, uh, an immediate concern to us, and I know that um, CV Fiber has been uh, acting has been polling its um, members in its towns um, as to um, what their um, interest might be in, in broadband. Uh, so uh, I, for one, am kind of curious to know how that's going. Uh, do you feel the process is working well? Are you getting the information that you need? Uh, are there ways that you feel it could be done um, more effectively, more reliably? So I think I didn't want to say too much more or less throw out a bunch of things which may or may not generate questions, but mainly also let you know uh, kind of how we're proceeding to, um, <clears throat> to our hopefully uh, um, receipt of uh, an accepted proposal uh, sometime in mid-summer uh, and then acting on it uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, a target date of, of um, having a business plan and feasibility study uh, by early next year. So I'd be happy to entertain questions. And Barry uh, has <coughs> probably a lot more detailed knowledge uh, on some of these aspects than I do. That's his first false statement. I want to yeah. Make sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you identified what your high-speed broadband needs are for your own operations, you said you're switching over. So, so what are you, do you need? 100 megs, 1 gig, 25. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not 1 gig. Um, I'm not, you have to recognize as a board member, um, I really can't speak for the utility. Uh, I'm, I'm essentially a member. So uh, I can't really get into the, you know, 
I don't really have that information available. 100 meg, uh, I think, is sufficient. Um, and 25 is even uh, maybe acceptable. I think I think we're going to go by what what if the same information you guys are, are getting and what what I've heard from Jeremy and other people at the at the both the House and Senate is a hundred hundred in and hundred out is, is basically what everybody should be shooting for and we're not going to try to start with less but that's something we'll have to have to define. That's our target until we know better. Can I get some clarification, Ray? Were you asking what the utilities and needs are? With the utilities were as opposed to what the customers were. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Can I answer that from a technical perspective? You get one gigabit to slow it down costs more in, the, in equipment. So your default is going to be one gigabit whether you use it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. Yes. Uh, Siobhan from Orange. And so the the uh, needs assessment or this feasibility study is this for you to hang the wire according to what the legislation this year was talking about? <coughs> is that what you're looking at? We don't we don't really know. I so think it's just, at, it's at the last meeting. meeting. We don't really know what our role will be per se. Um, that's what we have to assess. But basically, I think what we're all looking at is the wire is going to have to be hung on the poles. Uh, from just the conversations I've had with some of the people here who helped educate me is we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at one aspect of running the wire in our electrical space because that has the potential overall to possibly be the best way to go, but we don't we don't know that. So I, I listened to Michael and Jeremy and other people just to try to even understand. I know what a wire is. <laughs> I know what a fiber is, but I can't tell you much more than that. But that's why we, we really have to see, I mean, you know, co-ops around the country have been doing this over the last couple of years. Some just do the backbone, uh, some go all the way to the house, some do uh, combinations with third parties. You know, we'll be, there's, I don't know that there's many places that have uh, CUDs, you know, uh, available to them but you know as I said before our two words are collaborative and cooperative. That's how we look at how we the end result is what we're going to try to get from. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, David Healy, Callis. Um it, and I have I'm on the agenda for later to talk about the board you know, the business planning group was up to last week and one of the things we have been working on is maybe we ought to be looking at where are the overlaps between all the planning grants and the study grants and and how do they how do you actually articulate something that relates to each other so we're not duplicating effort or you know enhancing each other's efforts is pretty much what we're thinking and we'll have a little paper on that at some point right Ken yes <laughs> well, I, think I should point out that uh, also uh, Tim Tierney of the uh, Northern Border Regional Commission, when this proposal was submitted, or about that same time, he said, you know, we're getting so many proposals submitted that it's highly likely that a lot of them are going to be um, combined in some yeah. some form or another, mm -hmm. essentially to avoid this kind of yeah. this kind of duplication and make something. I just say the, the one difference that we have between all of these, we, we, we're a utility. So we really have to take a look at how it interfaces with it. We would have to do it even if you just came to us, but we really have to take a look at how it interfaces with our system in terms of which way we, is acceptable for us to go. And we have 41 towns, so you guys are 17. So we, we're going to need it broader, but we don't have to, for instance, uh, and I don't know where you're at with this day, but we don't have to go and try to resurvey the 17 towns that you've done if you feel it's come out well. So, you know, and if that survey is something we want to build on and just add to, we can go to the other towns and find another way of doing it if we found some loopholes of it and we wouldn't want to do it. That's Michael Brown from Plainfield Towns. Steve, um, have you guys pursued discussions with Delco yet about how to, besides their providing access at a substation, are you talking to them about how to 
expand that throughout the yes. network? Is there anything you can share with us in there? Uh, Barry would have to share it with you because he, he might know something. Um, no, nothing. No, I did. The, uh, we began discussions with them. They're, what they're going to be doing is um, surveying our, our lines. There's a lot of questions, obviously, that I have to rely on you and others, but um, they're basically talking to us primarily at this point about being able to hook up all our substations. And the question that will come that we will still have to answer is, how do we ensure there's enough capacity there to do everything we want? They, they say there is. I talked to Carol Malone a little bit, very briefly on the phone, but it, it's hard when, you know, we're not we're not expert enough sometimes to ask the question. So, but before we get into anybody putting any wire on the phone, we will know some answers to some questions that we, and that's the big one in my mind. What do we need to be able to make sure whether we do it or anybody else does it? That we got enough to get that done. So, I'm sure they have You did? Yeah, okay. okay. Any other questions for Washington Electric folks? You, hi, one, David Healy with Cows. Are you fairly certain you're getting the money from the Northern Borderlands? No one's ever certain until my dad told me don't cash your file. Okay, because I saw the, the RFP thing and I said, oh, interesting. No, we don't. Okay. We don't yeah. They said July 15th they're going to let us, everybody know. But no, yeah. Every grant I've submitted, I've always been supremely confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, they, that's great. I just want to say that uh, CV Fiber did not submit an independent <coughs> Borderlands project. Oh, I thought you were We did a letter of intent, but never followed through on that. Oh, I see. So just mm -hmm. saying on that. Okay. The, have you guys done your consult, your uh, your survey yet? They'll be talking about that later. Okay. <laughs> no. no. That's a short question. I mean, we did, we mentioned in, this proposal is fairly open-ended, yeah. and we did, we mentioned uh, you know, potential collaborations with uh, CUD since obviously we overlap with CD fiber. The southern part of our territory mm -hmm. extends into EC yeah. fiber territory. So uh, it would make a natural yeah. uh, collaboration. Now, my own experience with collaborations is generally positive, but for them to be successful going over the rocky roads, uh, figuratively speaking, is a bit. Everybody, you know, a collaboration works in the long term when both sides get something out of it. Both sides need each other. Yeah. So I think that's uh, something I, I was keeping in mind. Yes. John, you had something? Can I just ask Barry, yeah. is the feeling positive from your side that, that this is, has the potential to be an excellent fit? for you and for at least these 17 towns and probably all 41 towns that, that serve? I, I, I would tell you that I'm optimistic that we'll be able to fill some capacity, but I don't know because and I'm not able to say because we haven't got there yet, right. is we've been told that, and Michael and David will say, that basically this is probably a $25 million investment. So what I'm what I'm convinced myself, and I speak just for myself on this, that in order to make this work, we're going to have to be able to tap some significant grant funds. And part of that for me is because I know that EC Fiber has been hooking at people at $75 of hookup. I don't see that happening, although I don't know. In, in one of our most needy areas, Orange, which is also one of the most economically depressed areas. So I'm optimistic if there's funds out there that we can have some role in retaining them, uh, what role we do in other than making sure wires are strung either inside or outside of the electrical area in our poles. I think we can, we can be helpful in all of those. I, I don't know the, an, the final end answer until we get some more numbers. I think one answer is we have to do this feasibility study. It's not it's not just a pro forma thing that we have to check off before we proceed. I think for for everybody to be convinced enough that we can do this, we need to have a positive uh, <clears throat> positive 
feasibility study uh, come out of this. And so it's crucial for us to do this and to do it reasonably well. Right. Hi, uh, Ray Phillip here in Northfield. Uh, do you have a timeline for any of this? For example, for the feasibility study and for when you'd like to finish? Uh, feasibility study we would like to complete in early January of 2020. I think the bottom line is that if we're going to go after any real grant money, <laughs> the cycle for the feds is the end of May of each year. And I don't, again, it, this may be totally, the, the study may come back and say, hey, you can do this and everybody wants it and everybody will pay and it's a great book, a great uh, take rate, but I just feel that we're going to probably have to go after that money, so we'd like to be able to make some decisions about doing that so that we could apply for something by that end of May day. Otherwise, we're another year ahead unless or behind unless there's, which could happen. This is not an instantaneous fix. It's got to be done well. And we, we can't afford to do it wrong. So. Siobhan? Um, when you said that you could, the Siobhan from Orange, when you said you couldn't see that happening, you're talking about the $75 install, are you talking about because it's too much money? I, and the this is my own, take it? Strict, strictly my own personal mm -hmm. feeling, not based on anything oh, other yeah, than if you went to any of my neighbors and said, we'll hook you up for $75, they'd be like, what? Exactly. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. That's exactly, I mean, I wouldn't sign up for $75. Well, I would, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it just depends on where But I'm. I would also be willing to help other people out. To, yeah, to yeah. Sign up too. No, it's just that I'm at the end Gener of my business generational cycle. difference I'm not in the uh, anyway. perspective. Yeah. I don't, I'm not dependent on it. That's really, you know, when I, I, I was at a national uh, uh, annual meeting to all the co-ops, and they have students who were on a panel, and every single one of them, these were bright high school and early college, they said they wanted to go back to their communities, but they wouldn't, they couldn't go back to the community unless it at high speed internet as part of what they were going to do. And the best time to go back was in their mid 20s when it would be entrepreneurial. And this is a vehicle. And that, that really, uh, that hit hard with me. I mean, it was, these were intelligent young people um, who were in a different world than I am. So I just, uh, but I don't want to leave the other people behind me. Susan, I'm going to give you the last question. This um, might be off base, but. Um, now that you're into broadband, it, does Wash Electric Co-op have any future insights as to cell service? Uh -huh. I don't want to go there. <laughs> cell service. No, I don't. We haven't. I mean, that's not. Something. I don't know. I don't know enough of whether cell service will be offered through. I know some co-ops offer cell service through their, their, their fiber, uh, but we that's down the road. So that's nothing that. You are looking at. No. Okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Treasurer's report. Becca. Yes. <coughs> <coughs> so right now we have a total of six thousand nine hundred twenty-two dollars and eighty-two cents, um, and that's broken down for thousand five hundred sixty in checking. Um, Two thousand three hundred thirty-seven and eighty-two cents in our snowball fundraising account, and twenty-five dollars in savings. Any what were we last month? Uh, about a hundred dollars under that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <I missed. laughs> it's been a slow month. <laughs> so we also haven't. I mentioned last meeting that we do have a monthly donor, um, and that is it, it's ten dollars a month, but it is monthly, um, and. When we had our last meeting, they had already given for May, but they haven't yet given for June. So you can add 10 bucks to that. <laughs> um, did we fix the, the thing with Snowball not believing that we were a nonprofit? Yes, pretty much. I mean, they, they still haven't made the transfer, but we are working our way through the management of convincing them that we should be able to have our money. Great. Okay. Any other questions for Becca? So, all, so donations through the web are now working just fine. You know, like if, if I happen to find someone who wanted to donate, send them to the website. That's the best way. Yeah, the, the the website donations were always working, as far as I know. It was mm -hmm. just the issue of getting it from that from that collector from there to our bank account. Mm -hmm. 
they, they didn't believe that we were a nonprofit because we're not a 501. Okay, yeah. thank you. And then I've also been working with um, Alan Gilbert um, and working on trying to get uh, Schwab to see us as a appropriate place where people can uh, send donor advised um, funds. So hopefully once we get that process worked out with Schwab, we'll be able to then duplicate that process if other people want to give that way as well. Can I ask, does Noval charge us for They do. So there's an option when people donate online, whether they want to increase their donation enough to take care of the fee or whether they don't and then the fee is taken out. What is the fee deductible, tax deductible, if they choose to pay the fee? I believe so, yes, because it's still then they're basically giving an, an additional donation for us to use to pay the fee. So, but so the least expensive way to send a check. Yes. Yeah. Did I see a hand up? Completely imagined it. Great. Um, Did anybody miss the sign-in sheet? Okay, I just want to pass it back this way to towards Becca. Okay, uh, the update of CV Fiber rules of procedure. Um, I sent out the electronic version of this, and I have a, a paper one that we can all um, that we can all sign. And uh, um, I'm happy to to walk through this. Um, especially for the, the, the newer folks who maybe weren't here when we adopted this last July. Um, I think I'm gonna do that. Really the only changes that I made here were change, uh, changing references to Central Vermont Internet to CV Fiber to reflect the, the doing business as name change that we uh, adopted last year. Um, so yeah, I, I will go through this. Stop me, scream out if you have uh, questions uh, or if things need to be changed. This doesn't have to be um, this doesn't have to be the final the final reading, so we'll count this as a first reading and then we'll adopt it next time around if that's okay with you. Um, so we're a communications union district formed and operated by its member municipalities. We have 17 at present. Um, the legislative power and authority of CV Fiber and the admi and administration and the general supervision of all fiscal, prudential, and governmental affairs thereof are vested in the governing board here, except as specifically provided under otherwise in statute. Um, the way this is written is essentially to take a lot of what's already in statute and put it here, essentially make it available um, and understandable maybe not understandable, but available anyways to everybody. Uh, the governing board gets one representative, one delegate from each member municipality and one or more alternates. Um, uh, let's see. So um, one added thing that's not in statute is the chair, that's me. However, without such specific authorization of the board may speak for the governing board in matters of policy as well as on actions taken by the board. So I went to the legislature, for example, and I testified and I said, you should pass this bill and it'll be great for us. So um, as a public body, um, because we're a municipality, the governing board is required by law to conduct its meetings in accordance with the Vermont Open Meeting Law. Um, meetings of the governing board must be open to the public at all times, except as provided um, in statute, which would be for executive sessions. And, with, and we've only, I don't know that we've, we went into executive session once. That was for a strategic discussion about um, some contra upcoming contracts. Um, let's see. Uh, so B, application. These rules are adopted in accordance with uh, statute and shall be readopted annually. This is what we're in the process of doing now. Um, organization shall annually elect chair, vice chair, so on and so on. This is um, it's out of statute. Um, if the chair can't do his or her job, then the vice chair will. If the vice chair can't do his or her job, then the governing board uh, appoints one of its members to take over to take over the meeting. Um, upon the death, disability, resignation, or removal of the chair or vice chair, the governing board shall forthwith elect a successor to the office until the next annual meeting. Um, a quorum is 50% of the district members. So if, you, if there's an alternate, so for example, I'm gonna pick on you, Susan, so you're here representing Woodbury and you're the alternate. Yes. But right now, you're acting as Woodbury's delegate, so you would, are a voting member. We talk more about that too, but you count as part of the quorum. This is not, there is no worries about, about meeting the quorum tonight, because out of 17, we need, um, what, eight, um, nine, nine rather. 
So if we have nine towns represented, we're good to go. Um, informal discussion of an agenda item shall be permitted while no motion is pending. We haven't had any motions today, so it's been relaxed, free-for-all, although when we get a lot of people talking, sometimes it can uh, can drag, and then we may kind of engage Robert's rules to make sure that uh, things move smoothly. Um, a motion shall only be made by a delegate or an alternate serving in the absence of a delegate. All motions require a second. The chair may make motions and may vote on all questions before the governing board. That's different than the policy of some select boards, where they prefer that the select board chair not make motions. Um, once there's a motion on the table, only delegates and alter alternates serving in the absence of a delegate may speak to a motion. So, which is, um, so if you're an alternate and your delegate is here, we're going to ask that you kind of kindly, respectfully, step back and let us finish with the finish with the discussion. Um, in that regard, am I allowed to speak now? I'm an alternate. My, my member is here. Um, because there's no motion on the floor, you can okay. do lots of things. Is is there the option? for the voting members of the board to allow for other people to speak if that's, if that's germane to or valuable for to the discussion. Yes, um, but to, to keep things uh, orderly, that would be that would be a, like a special condition. But yes, that would be that would be something that the board would the, the board would allow the chair to recognize them. Yes. Um, there shall be no limit to the number of times that um, number of times a delegate or alternate serving in the absence of a delegate may speak to a motion. Motions to close or limit de debate will not be entertained. So that's different from Robert's rules, and that's a, one of the Robert's rules that I actually like because when people kind of go on and on, sometimes it's just so they can hear themselves talk, and the rest of the board's like, "I want to go home." So, um, but we we don't have that, and we've not had that problem. If a member has already spoken on a topic, he or she may not be recognized again until others have been first given the opportunity to comment or until others have been given the opportunity to comment as many times as any other speaker has commented. So that's one of those things that you get a chance to talk, everybody gets a chance to talk before you get to go again. It's reasonably egalitarian, I think. Um, anytime you'd like to, you can request a roll call vote. Uh, the request must be sustained by at least one other member. So if two of you think that we can do a roll call, roll call vote rather than just shouting ayes or nays or whatever, you can do that. Um, whenever somebody is attending electronically and there is a vote, <clears throat> the roll call vote is required, and that's also statute. Um, each member's delegation shall be entitled to cast one vote. Only delegates and those alternates serving the absence of delegate shall vote. Any action adopted by a majority of the votes cast at a meeting of the governing board at which a quorum is present shall be the action of the board. So this could mean that if we only have nine people here and five of them vote in favor and four of them vote against, that's the decision of the entire board with all 17 members. So show up, I guess, because that's the hidden message there. Um, agendas are, um, are to be posted um, at least 24 hours prior to a regular meeting. I try to get these out on Friday. Um, uh, let's see, time allotted for each item of business to be considered by the board. Those who wish to be added to the meeting agenda should contact me. Generally, if you get to me before Friday, I can get you on the agenda. If you think you need more than 15 minutes or so, just make sure you, you let me know of that. At this point, agendas are being posted automatically to the town clerks, so there's no... Uh, they're being emailed to the town clerks. Yeah, how, how the town clerks decide to post them or otherwise um, distribute them is essentially up to them. I can't, can't really compel town clerks to do anything in particular. Um, let's see. Um, so 48 hours prior to a regular meeting, if we have to call a special meeting because something really pressing is coming up, uh, we have 24 hours for that. Uh, the agenda must also be made available to any person who requests such an agenda prior to the meeting. So I can email those out. Uh, the next one is it has to be posted. Um, oops, I already found a something to change for next time. Um, if we maintain a website, the agenda needs to be posted there. Uh, I post it to the Facebook page. We will eventually post it to the website as well. Um, additions to or deletion from the posted agenda must be made as the first act of business at a meeting. Statute. 
Additions to the agenda shall require a majority vote of the governing board and shall be made only when necessary to respond to an unforeseen occurrence or a condition requiring immediate attention by the board. Um, that's not something that we've actually been enforcing. Um, maybe we can talk about that later. Um, typically, we just done, done it by acclamation. Nobody's kind of screamed out when um, you know I've added an item or when um, Josh wanted to add the item. So maybe we need to change the policy to do that. I think ev everybody here is respectful and kind and generally pushing in the same direction. So maybe something to modify next time. Uh, special meetings. Emergency meetings may be held without public announcement, without posting of notices, and without 24 hours notice to members, provided that you can post some notice thereafter. This is, um, again, this is out of statute. This is making sure that everybody understands the different um, kind of permutations of meetings that we might have. You can always choose to attend electronically, over the telephone or Skype or whatever. It's not, um, it's not ideal, having done this um, um, for this board, having done this for um, select board meetings and other things like that. It's not ideal, but it, but it works. So as long as there's one, one person physically present at the meeting to essentially allow for the public to, be, to come to a place, um, all of the rest of you could attend remotely if you chose to. Now it's sort of a chicken and the egg sort of thing as we're building out broadband in central Vermont. That may not actually be an option for you at some of your houses to get <coughs> cell service or reasonable uh, audio conferencing. Uh, right. Just summarizing now. Mm -hmm. Is that actually possible within, uh, are we having some kind of a broad broadcast or do we need a separate uh, computer uh, connection? For each person who would attend uh, remotely? Um, if, if I knew that there was going to be more than one person attending remotely, I can create essentially like a meeting room, go to meeting or something like that, and I can have everybody in that same meeting and just sort of with the, you know, with the speaker on, like, you know, like Phil had, had me on last time. And you, you can have multi person Skype calls too, so it would just be one person ideally would be collecting all of those callers. Um, and if you think you need, you want to attend a meeting um, remotely, the, as much uh, advance notice as you can give to me would be really, really helpful. So I can, I can plan and I can make sure that I have numbers, that we've tested connections, making sure everything's working smoothly. Uh, let's see. Uh, members of the public shall be afforded reasonable opportunity to express opinions about matters considered by the governing board as long as order is maintained according to those, these rules. At the beginning of each meeting, there shall be 10 minutes afforded for open public comment. By majority vote, the governing board may increase the time for open public comment and its place in the agenda. A reasonable opportunity for public comment on agenda individual items shall be allowed at the discretion of the chair. This is not, again, not historically been too much of an issue. Um, Comment by the public or members of the governing board must be addressed to the chair or the board as a whole and not to any individual member of the governing board or public. Again, um, this is a bit more of a, of a fail-safe to allow us to prevent the meeting from going off the rails. Members of the public must be acknowledged by the chair before speaking. If a member of the public has already spoken on a topic, he or she may not be recognized again until others have been first given the opportunity to comment. Order and decorum shall be observed by all persons present at the meeting. Neither members of the governing board nor the members of the public shall delay or interrupt the proceedings or the peace of the meeting or interrupt or disturb any member while speaking. Members of the governing board and members of the public are prohibited from making non-germane or threatening remarks. Okay. Sadly, we had, had to include this. Um, Members of the governing board and members of the public shall obey the orders of the chair or other presiding member. The chair should ad adhere to the following process to restore order and decorum of meeting, my, but may bypass any or all steps when he or she determines in his or her sole discretion that deviation from the process is warranted. Um, first, call the meeting to order and remind the members of the applicable rules of procedure. Two, declare a recess or table the issue. Three, adjourn the meeting until a time and date certain. And then there's a place for a bunch of signatures in the back. Thoughts, feedback, anything? More discussion next time around? I don't know that this is appropriate time. This is Martin Woodbury. I don't know if this is appropriate time, but I sent you an email about mm -hmm. um, why why this body is not a 501c 
and obviously we have some grant issues that there are more grants offered to 501 C's than there are to Vermont municipals, communities like that you have or like we have here. Um, I don't know what the appropriate thing is to do, whether I should make a motion that we change our our organization to a 501c, or I don't know what the appropriate thing is. I need some guidance on you. Sure. Uh, the, the reason that when, when this organization was founded, the reason that I started it in the way that, it, that I did was so that it be, could be a municipality, specifically so that it wouldn't be a 501. The reason is when we eventually go and start building our, our various um, uh, infrastructure bits, um, we can get cheaper money through the municipal bond bank uh -huh. than a 501c3 can. Um, there may be there may be a time when we need an affiliated 501 organization to go after certain other grants, but um, for the most part, the grants that we're most interested in, we qualify for as a governmental enti entity. Thank you. So even though we have to go through this extra layer of procedure and process, um, I think I think it's totally worth it, and I, and I think um, I also I also appreciate the openness. I appreciate that um, that Orca shows up to this because we are a community-owned um, entity, and people can generally feel pretty good about us kind of being open and doing the right thing. And just to add to that, I feel very good because it makes us accountable to our member communities. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I feel very good about us being a municipality because it makes us accountable to our member communities. I'm serving my community. I'm not just with this nonprofit. Oh boy, what are they doing? You know, I'm, it, it, it has some weight to it mm -hmm. that might not otherwise exist. Thank you. Jerry? Jerry Diamantidis, alternate Berlin. We did have a lot of discussion about 501c3. And the affiliated 501c3 that Jeremy alluded to may be something that can be done in the future. If, if that opens up other grant opportunities, whereas this this entity would not be a 501c3, but there would be one dedicated to supporting this municipal entity. So it's 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 a very good idea. It's something that we've talked about uh, in the past, and it's it's something that will remain an option. Thank you. Um, so while we're talking about rules of procedure and how we're organized, um, new member orientation? Yes, so I was thinking that um, <clears throat> based on some questions I have and also have gotten and also just because I think it would be a good thing to do of um, doing a new member orientation that could also be an old member orientation if anybody was interested in reorienting themselves. Um, where I would kind of go through, you know, a summary of the minutes for over the past year and um, what's on the Google Drive and those kinds of things and um, get people contact rosters and all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking that like half an hour before the next governing board meeting would be a good time to do that if that works for people, but I'm open to other times if that would not be good for people. So I just kind of wanted to throw that idea out there and see um, a, if that time is good for people, and then B, if there are any things in particular that people want to make sure I include in that. And if there's... It would be July 9th, is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. So you offer, this is Martin Woodbury, are you offering to meet like 30 minutes earlier? Is that yeah. what you're... you're yeah, so I would do, uh, would hopefully be able to get in here half an hour early. Maybe, or Maybe. Um, or you'd certainly have space over at um, Maplewoods. Yeah, we could also do um, over the finance committee. A lot of times has met over at the Maplewood service area, um, and uh, right before this meeting. So we could, if we can't get in here, I could do it over there. Would it be more practical just to do it as part of the meeting agenda? We don't have to worry about it. You get more than nine people. <laughs> 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 oh, um, well, pe people might feel more free to talk. If they're not on camera during a regular meeting, I mean, ask ask more questions, get a bit more <clears throat> detailed history. Yeah, but can you have nine people? I don't know that there will be nine. That there will be nine new people who oh, want. Like, yeah. so mm -hmm. We have alternates that we would need to include in that. Would that get us? I mean, I'm I'm open to whoever wants to come. I mean, we could. It could also be. Yeah, we could do it. 
a couple times or something like that too? Yes. I mean, the other thing practically is having a little, and I don't want to create work for you, so I feel bad saying this, but actually just having the material that you present mm -hmm. would be really helpful. So okay. if it's just two or three slides, that would be mm -hmm. awesome. Because it'll just remind everybody where to look for stuff and what's going on. So, so here, here's another option, Becca. If you want to like just record a, um, a video lecture of some mm -hmm. sort, I mean, just post it to everybody. Okay. I mean, it, it, that prevents you from asking questions. Um, but if anybody has questions, um, maybe that should be addressed. And if you wanted to, to sort of talk through some slides or talk through some um, uh, previous minutes and such, that might be the, a good start, starting point. And then individual questions could be addressed to you or to whomever else. Okay. Another permutation, just to throw it out there, not that it's necessarily good, we could go into executive session so that cameras and public are not present. We would not be able to go into executive session for that. Mm -hmm. There's only a handful of reasons that we can, and uh, training is not, not one of them. The so contracts, uh, impending um, legal issues, personnel issues. Um, yeah. If, um, that's even questionable whether that's ex exactly um, possible. But there's yeah, there's only a handful of um, yeah. Pr if premature public disclosure of what we're going to talk about would put the district at a disadvantage, then we could find that, and then we could go into executive session. But it's but we're a bit restricted. So I've got Greg Kelly, Barry City, and I would support either that you suggest either a meeting before. Uh, training before the meeting, or doing it electronically. Okay. Um, I'll shoot to get something out then, unless other people have. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. 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 The quarantine's not an issue if you sworn the meeting. You warn the the there's preliminary meeting starting at five thirty. Then the quarantine's not an issue. Right. Yeah. You just have to post an agenda, take minutes. Mm -hmm. So, but but I mean, if again, if you don't want to have to warn it, if you don't want it to have to be a, a public meeting, there are other there are other options. Mm -hmm. So how about we try the video thing, and I send that out to folks, and then I will also put together folders for everybody, including alternates, which I may give them to you if your alternate doesn't come very often. Some alternates come all the time, but um, that would be for you know just kind of your board member packet, and then um, I can, and then we can kind of play it by ear in terms of you know I can stay. I can come a little early to meetings to answer questions, or people can email me, or whatever. Yes? I think a video is a great idea. Sorry, Jonathan Williams, Marshfield. And also, it could be used as a recruitment tool for those communities whose volunteers are not as forthcoming. <laughs> well, now you're putting Speaking pressure for myself. on me, Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> to make it an entertaining video. <laughs> Sorry, no pressure. That's all right. We can do that. Um, and I, yeah. That's fine. Uh, Jeremy, like the one advantage of doing the video is that you know you could keep you know do video one and then video two if you know a year from now if you want to make another one to kind of update people from what's happened from now until so kind of a continual update for new people coming into the organization. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Uh, policy on grant submissions, Phil. We're here, we're I can see everybody. Uh, Phil Hayek, delegate, delegate from um, where did I live? Uh, Middlesex. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, the policy committee uh, met to take up what we were referring to just simply as a grants policy, which we turned into a submission policy, and we we really had some confusion. Uh, about what our charge was as we, we first started to debate this. So we we focused, at least for that session, on the idea uh, about some requirements for uh, submitting proposals of various categories. And actually, Becca had sent out the minutes from our meeting yeah, earlier. I, I mean, a couple of hard copies, so there can be one on okay. each table. So. Uh, the actual policy, which is very short, is embedded right right in those minutes. So we realize that you know there may be other issues that we need to address about uh, grants, possibly grants management, although most of that is spelled out uh, in the conditions under which you receive the grant. But we thought we'd at least get this out, see if this is what people were, were thinking about, 
and allow for some discussion, some feedback, and we can continue to go back and revise this as needed. So what we came up with was really um, a, a three uh, category uh, application um, process. It's basically that any board or committee member may apply for an appropriate grant on behalf of um, Central Vermont Fiber Board with these limitations. Grants for $10,000 or greater and or with substantive uh, reporting or compliance requirements require the approval of the full board prior to submission. Um, and again, we thought that grants at that level, the grantees probably want to know that the board has passed some kind of resolution uh, in favor of the grant. So we felt at that level we should, um, we should make that full board. Uh, grants in smaller amounts, $1,000 to $10,000, uh, can be submitted <coughs> with the prior approval of the executive committee, which is basically Jeremy, myself, and Becca, uh, but without full full board approval, and again, we may want to debate that. Um, and then very small grants, up to $1,000, we're kind of looking at as almost the donation level of kind of uh, grant. Uh, and that those uh, really did not um, require uh, prior, uh, any kind of prior approval of either the executive committee or the full board. Um, I think for the most part, anybody who, or any of us who find a grant opportunity like that um, and are looking to, to help uh, support some of the goals can go ahead and do that or you know of a fund because um, we kind of felt like that's, that's coffee money. Um, and we'll, we'll take anything we can get, but it didn't need a whole long drawn out process. And I think most of us who are going to be involved in something like that are, tend to bring it up and, and report to the board anyway that this is something, or ask for some guidance that goes, oh, I know of this opportunity, should I in fact submit a proposal? And, you know, we're probably not heads. And stuff. <coughs> so it's that simple um, as far as what we came up with at this point. And, you know, we're open to suggestions. Anybody else who's on the board want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Comments? Sure. Yeah, I have a question just for discussion. I'm, I'm suspecting that you guys already talked through this, but I'd be interested to hear how, how it went. So when you're submitting for a grant, you're committing CV fiber to to do something in a certain way right and what is the I guess the executive committee is the check kind of the final reviewer of that grant before it goes out to be sure that somebody isn't you know misaligned with either our capabilities or or processes Right, yeah, at that, at that middle level, that certainly was some of the thinking that it should at least go to the executive committee, depending upon you know, how much uh, the grant reporting requirements, are they onerous or not onerous, then that's the kind of thing, is it aligned with goals, yeah. So just to follow up with that, yeah, Jeremy, what is the, uh, or, or Bill, what, what, how does the executive committee work again? It's three people, so two out of three, and it moves forward without the rest of the of the board. Is that correct? That's what we're proposing. I mean, that, uh, as this is written, that's what. That's yeah. way and that yeah. may may or may not be what the full board wants to have as a policy. Mm -hmm. But we're, so we're basically throwing this out there at least to get some discussion and generate the kinds of questions you're uh, bringing up. David Healy, Callis. The uh, the one thing about applying for grants, you also have to accept a grant. <laughs> so. There, there may be, you know, you, you may discover something in between. Right. So, I don't, right. you know, how rigid you become with a grant application versus accepting the grant might might weigh in on this. Right. John? Well, why, why separate those at all? I mean, why, why ask three people to make the decision for 17 people or 17 towns? I mean, what's the, what was the rationale to uh, saying as I recall, in terms of, again, the discussion and helping out um, members, that we really saw a difference in that kind of $1,000 to $10,000 category. You know, th those are not large grants, um, as opposed to $10,000 and up. 
it could have been twenty five thousand and up. I don't know where we, we, we cut the line on that, but we felt that the smaller submissions did not necessarily uh, have to take up the vetting by the by the full board. But again, you know, yeah, we want to write this the way the board wants it written. So as a member, this Andrew Gilbert Cabot, just to add what Phil said, I think some of the thinking in this for small stuff from the expediency perspective, and some of that's my experience. I you know I brought a five hundred dollar grant to the town to a, a nonprofit in Cabot. It's like you know, and I informed the board of it, but there's no obligation on it. There's no you know, it's not like we have any compliance or anything. We may not even get it if we don't, you know, use it in time, but it was just out there. So it's like, do you really need to go, you know, at some level, for moderate levels of a lot of money without a lot of onerous requirements, do you really need to, can you just go out and get it? Um, versus, obviously, if there's, what Jerry brought up, if there's any kind of, you know, the USDA one, that's something that requires full board review. So we were just trying to distinguish between, you know, not all grants are equal, but, you know, it's open to debate. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Williams, Marshfield. Um, I would, uh, as a professional grants writer, uh, I would urge the Central Vermont Fiber Governing Board to not differentiate between these simply because, in my experience, um, there is rarely correlation or causation between the amount of money that one receives and the reporting requirements. <laughs> I, have seen, I have truthfully seen grants for $800,000 or more that required a three-page proposal and there's no reporting. And I have seen grants for $1,000 that the, the, work, the amount of reporting requirements is so onerous that it's, it's simply not worth it. I would also um, suggests that we incorporate language for uh, applying for grants that are don't have a set monetary value, but that have an in-kind, uh, not from us, but from, say, someone is providing a service for us, but it is, it is qualified or they qualify it as a grant. And I would also uh, add a provision in here uh, as to who is responsible for uh, handling the reporting workload and or who is responsible, I assume it would be Jeremy, but who would be responsible for uh, signing the grant agreements themselves? I nominate you. Jeremy, <laughs> <laughs> really favor? Came up several times during our policy committee meeting, and mostly in vain for not having invited I'm, you to I, I apologize. write the draft. No, yeah. I, <laughs> I just wanted to address right. the, you the first involved. point, the way this is written grammatically, is it if it's an onerous reporting requirement, it doesn't matter the amount. If you look at if you look at the actual text, it is ten thousand dollars and or a substantive reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. So that's the first level. So that that addresses that. But the other stuff, no, it's not. But that only applies to ten thousand dollars or more. No, the way no. it's written grammatically, it's and or. <laughs> I wrote it explicitly for that. That's fair. Uh, and if, if or I, with substantive reporting requirements. Grants $10,000 or greater. And, and or. So if it's, so if it's, a, if it's like John's talking about and it's a $1,000 grant, but it's just so painful to manage, it would fall into category one. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. I wrote it like a program on that. <laughs> yeah, you should use parentheses. I, 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 I sequel code, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Alphanet from Plainfield. Uh, is there any discussion of sort of what is too onerous? <laughs> <laughs> we, we were kind of trying to avoid yeah. being that specific because it was going to be onerous for us to detail what was onerous. <laughs> yeah, it was oh, too onerous to be defined onerous. <laughs> Uh, Ray Bell here in Northfield. The, um, I didn't have a heartburn with this, but what what I don't get from this is um, where are we posting a copy of the grant application online? Or how are we archiving and capturing that information? And secondly, where where is uh, two and three being minuted? The first one is at a board meeting. The other two, the executive committee and, the, and anybody who submits something, how is it, where's the reporting requirement to come back to the board, or how is this otherwise captured? Well, presumably it would be reported, uh, reported as an informational item during a, a, a board meeting. So, for example, the, the Cabot grant, that was, you mentioned that in the last meeting, as I recall, um, and reported back that we got the $500, for example. Do we want to leave that implicit? Do we, do we want to make that explicit, that the copies of the application will be posted? And secondly, that they will be 
Well, if it's an action item, the board is voting on it. It has to be on a warned agenda. Right. right. So there's going to be then a presentation from whoever you know, committee or person is heading that up. I mean, I think Jerry, you walked us through all mm -hmm. the steps. Uh, reported several times on that grant. So um, before it came up to a, for a vote, the, the the board was pretty well informed. Right. So. So yeah, I mean, so with the with the previous grant applications, you know, I, we could put those put those out. I think I may have put the um, the Think Vermont grant application. I think that's in our Google Drive, which I believe everybody got a copy of. Is not everybody have a link to that? No, no. no. Okay, no. I'd say to do. Maybe that could be in some sort of video presentation. www. <laughs> 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 there you go. Wait so, wait a um, minute, that's Wild uh, Women of Woodbury. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a link to the Google Drive. Um, we will in include that as well. Um, I don't think the. Did, no, it, but and we sent out the copy of the, of the USDA grant mm -hmm. narrative. That not all of the like supplementary materials mm -hmm. and all the contracts and stuff. Not contracts. All of the uh, the things that I signed and had notarized, those weren't all included in there. But the narrative with the fundamental, what was it, 17 pages or whatever, that was that was sent to everybody. Happy to send out additional <coughs> copies as necessary. I, I'm less concerned about us getting it. I'm more concerned about the transparency of the whole. Thing. <coughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it needs to be online and available. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we're going to have a discussion about the website update, and I'm looking forward to that. For all of this material <coughs> to be there, mm -hmm. what? I guess I'll wait for that report, but we, so, that should be part of the you know modus operandi. Sure, and transparency, and, and and because we don't have um, at present quite yet, we don't have a, a website where it's easy just to drop things off and put them there. We um, we we put some things in piecemeal um, on Facebook, for example. Um, but yeah, and, but all of these things, because we are a public entity, all of these things are public records and can be requested by anyone um, as a public record in, in the state of Vermont. So your emails, your personal account emails related to business of CV Fiber are discoverable under the public records law, just so you know. So don't be, don't be surprised. Um, there is a process for responding to such things. So if you want to make yourself a separate email account to handle these and maybe that's something that we can talk about too with the um, there are some accounts that have already been created and I don't know where those live or if that got handed off from Elliot or whatever but we can maybe talk about that next um, so yes so we are statutorily obliged to make these things public we're not statutorily obliged to post all of them I think still think it's a good idea and is the right thing to do you had something uh, I still don't. My question wasn't really answered as to Sorry. why there's a separation um, between the two. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense to me to to say, okay, well, nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. Um, we just, you know, two out of three people can can say, yeah, that's fine, but ten thousand requires seventeen people to uh, to be to acknowledge it. So, you know, I I just feel like money's money. The thousand dollars and less, or nine ninety nine and less, you know, yeah, it's a donation. But I think anything above that, it it doesn't make sense to um, to sort of deselect the board, um, as far as I'm concerned. So that's my. Um, I concur. I think that separating them might be more trouble than it's worth as well. And I'm just hy hypothesizing here. There may be an instance where we, as a municipality, a functioning municipality, are applying for a grant that a number of our constituent communities are also applying for. And in that instance, regardless of the amount of money, I, this, I've never seen this happen, but it may happen. In that instance, we may want to bring it, it, may, it should come to the entire board, such that we all have the opportunity to weigh in and we have instructions carried forth from our respective select boards or whatever saying no we don't even though this is a an asset to this body we, we do not want to apply for it we've been instructed not to vote for it, for it. Mm. and i think that is while unfortunate a, a possibility okay 
So how shall we proceed? Needs to be rewritten. <laughs> so, so anyone, uh, so if you have feedback or suggestions, um, send it to Phil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Send, send the suggestions to me. I'll put them together, and either we'll call another quick meeting, or I'll get a draft out, and then we'll meet to go over it. This is David Healy. My my brain is fuzzy on the RDA grant application process. The fact that I think three people put a lot of time into it and went in. I don't know if the board ever. Full board ever looked at it? Well, for for the USDA? Yeah. yeah it was submitted. To it was it was full submitted. Board okay. For review yeah. and comment. Yeah. But do we out. approve it? Yes. That's so, the question. Well, so you delegated you delegated the responsibility for applying for it to me. Correct. So I, that's different than this policy. Actually, I think you're making a distinction between actually submitting it. Well, the does it, the final review of here it is now it's prepared thing we're signing off on is. Well, so the question is: is do we grant applications are complex? Um, does the board say yes? We're going to apply for this money, and we'll leave it into the committee's hands to draft the thing, and the committee doesn't vote on the app, you know, the full th package, or does it come back to the whole committee and we might miss the deadline? For applying, well, that's what I'm trying to well, get. At. So, so my my suggestion is that um, that when an application is going to happen, that the wh whatever these tiers end up being, that the board or the executive committee, whatever, approves the application, and then whoever is delegated to go and write the application, they can go do that. Now, if we get the grant, right. and then we're going to start to become obliged to do things for whatever money, then that would have to be brought back um, to the rest of the board. I think uh, to explicitly accept it. I think one of the, one of the issues we were that came up in our discussion was a quick turnaround. Suddenly somebody finds out that there's a grant, <laughs> mm -hmm. and we've got two weeks to get something out. How can we make that? We don't want the red tape to be the enemy of us being able to go for a grant that would like be really awesome for us to get. We just heard about it, and you know, okay, maybe we can't turn it around two weeks. Jerry did an amazing job. <laughs> I'm, I was like blown away, honestly, at, at that. Um, I don't want us to get in the way of that, that kind of thing, That's because it, it encourages our members to keep our eyes open for that kind of thing. Otherwise, you don't know, think, oh yeah, we'll never go for that. That's got to go before the board. We've got to. So we're trying to err on the side of less red tape to make it more agile. <laughs> um, just to, if I may, uh, just to respond to that, I think with all the benefits that being a municipality confers, one of the drawbacks is that we don't move as quickly as, say, the Vermont Food Bank on these grant, app <laughs> these grant applications. Um, and I think that's intentional, that's built into the structure of us being a municipality such that everyone has their say. And also, um, I think one of the things that this policy should outline is how opportunities are tracked and reported so that if we do miss an opportunity that we can apply, we can prepare ourselves for the next fiscal year, the next time it, come, it arises, and then be more prepared and ready to submit well in advance of the deadline. So we, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, that's great. I, so, and I agree with that. My, I think one of my concerns is, is again, being and here's this guy's good. He's good about the work that's due with the website ownership. Yeah. Um, it, you know, we're very limited. We're all volunteers. We're all part-time. We don't have a grant coordinator. I know. And so we're trying to write a policy <laughs> to define a grant coordinator in, in virtue, you know, where then we as 17 people act like a grant coordinator, I think is unrealistic. So, you know, we were just trying to come up with something that at least met some obligation to the board and the community of being aware of what was going on, giving people an opportunity to apply until such a point that we could actually have a grant coordinator. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the philosophy I brought to it. But that's just John, I'm sure John says <laughs> Jerry. Jerry from Berlin again. Going back to David's original question, which I think is a really good one. What I heard you describe I think is kind of a two step process. One, the board approved applying for the grant and we had to actually submit a paper that says the board approves this. But the board never voted to approve the final content of the grant application. 
And if we had to, it would either have been an emergency session yeah. or we would have just missed the deadline. Um, and that's, that it was, as I say, it was sent out for review and comment, but to have that final step makes it really, really difficult from a time perspective. Yeah, it was, I mean, <laughs> on, with, with both the electronic filing and the hand delivering filing, it was very, very <laughs> last minute. Absolutely. Um, Dan from uh, Montpelier, the, uh, just thinking of other municipalities like uh, Montpelier where the city council does authorize, you know, in other words, looks at application possibilities that are brought forward by the planning department or whatever and allows them to submit, you know, per their own cognizance when they are, uh, you know, uh, needed to be submitted without the second, uh, you know, like, um, you know. So unless there's, like you said, something onerous in terms of reporting requirements and stuff that would be uh, necessary to consider in the process, we do have to give uh, you know whoever's going to write the grant a certain amount of flexibility because these things come up with deadlines and we're not going to um, meet our meetings are not going to match those deadlines. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I would think that if the board approved applying for a grant, the grant application itself is just factual information. So I don't, I guess I don't understand why the board would need to vote on the actual written application itself if they had already agreed to pursue the grant. John, we'll give you the last word and we'll wrap this well, up I in the interest of time. This word, but, but I agree and, and I think that you know my concern about the $1,000 to $100,000 is separate mm -hmm. and that what you did for the USDA grant was definitely within permissible limits. And like you say, Montpelier or another city says, well, you know, Joe, you're responsible for that. We want this grant, go get it. So that's completely different from from this separation so I don't want I don't want my concern about this to, to be overall um, it's it's really yeah we want to if, if, if we know something and we have two weeks then we should have an emergency meeting to say Joe go get that grant but not to come back in a week or ten days and say oh did you do it right and all that other crap Okay. So, so what I what I think I would like all of you to do is, if you can take any of your any, if there's any other specific feedback that you have, and I have a couple things that I'm going to send along, send it to Phil, and then Phil, if you want to just as absorb as much as you can the sentiment of the of the room, and bring back <coughs> another copy for uh, for another crack at it sure. next yeah. week. Next and month. I'll either pull the policy committee together or just circulate whatever I pull together to. Put back on the agenda. Okay, so so go ahead and discuss it with the policy committee. If you if you do send it out, though, make sure you put a little note on there saying that's not for email discussion among the right. seventeen to thirty <laughs> members in the in the email chain, and don't CC reporters and don't CC the town clerks because they're just not interested in our internal chatter. <laughs> just saying. Good. Just um, saying. And everybody now has a contact roster and a and a link to the Google Drive. Thank you. Magic. <laughs> All right. Uh, website update. Jared. Uh, Jared Dawson, uh, alternate for house. I've uh, taken over responsibilities of uh, managing the website, sort of, uh, Elliot. And, um, I've been working on basically building a new one. Um, that Elliot's suggestion that the original was basic first step. Um, what I'm trying to do is build a place where there's more information for the public. We're very close to meeting uh, minutes, agendas, if there's public um, documents such as uh, grant applications, um, and also to promote CB Fiber, um, uh, news uh, to promote our um, fundraising efforts uh, things like that. Um, I, uh, full disclosure, I'm not a web developer at all. This is way outside of my normal range of operations. Um, Are you looking for help? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Great. Thank you. I am a weapon. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that's <Imagine fantastic>. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, basically I set up a, a copy of a development site um, and um, I think once I have something that's resembling something that resembles a final copy, we can send it out to everyone and get some input on it. Yeah, and I would say if anybody has a wish list items, so obviously minutes, meeting agendas, do donation link, all of that's all that's there. There's a spot for that stuff there. Any, anyways, there's other stuff that you think needs to be there. So I, I heard, you know, the, the grant applications. We can certainly include that. Um, a link to the videos. Right. Okay. So a, a link to Orca where they have all of our all of our meetings and such. If that makes sense. Presentations. Yeah, the presentations. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, maybe a section about uh, the, the 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 board, the the members. Oh, members. The, the list of members. Exactly. Okay. Or the list of uh, delegates. And you maybe mean? Maybe even. Uh, and this was something that was discussed earlier. A way to contact us. And maybe we do come up with a you know separate email. We all we all create a Gmail account or whatever it may be, and and then that way everything goes through that as opposed to our own personal email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's some. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. So, if, and if anything else pops in your mind, feel free to send it on to on to Jared. Any uh, other? A good map of the towns. Oh, yeah. the towns. So Step you can you can talk to David about that. You can have that look like anything like you want. A map story thing. Yeah. <laughs> I sent out everybody a map today. I don't know if anybody's got a chance to look at their email. But all of Rebecca's um, videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> cool. I did not see your map yet. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna, oh, I see it. <laughs> okay. Um, business Development Committee report back. David, that's yeah. that's you. The uh, Business Committee met last week. Um, we hadn't met in about two months. We got sidetracked by grant applications and <coughs> it was really difficult. But we did get together last week, uh, not the whole committee, but a good chunk of it, members. And we realized we really didn't have a charter, and so for our next meeting, we're hopefully going to have a charter. What, what is it we're about doing? And we'll report back to, to the full board what we can't do, <laughs> or we think we can't do. But one of the things we tried to do last year was to have a list of grant opportunities, and you know, keeping that current, we just didn't, nobody got assigned it, so it didn't happen. So we're trying to get a little more organized about what we do and how we do it. Um, so that was one of the first items we agreed to do. Um, we also, I realized in the going of the meeting, I left some, I didn't know all the members on the committee, <laughs> which is another thing we probably ought to put on the website is we've got three committees or four committees and these are the members with their contacts or something like that. And so I left out Jeremy from Barrytown. So he didn't get any of our notices. And I think um, Skip Lindsay from Woodbury, I think he was appointed to business development also okay. at the April meeting. So we can get that name. Me. What's that? He if did I can not get that name. Me. Sorry. <laughs> um, and operational planning. Committee will develop a process for identifying rollout priorities. In other words, we should have a calendar for when we're going to be doing things and how we. It may have to be modified periodically, but it's it's one of those things we we felt we needed to do. Then we had a discussion on all the, the activity on planning grants and. Uh, part of that was, I and mean, I don't know if Jeremy's going to give an update on that on H513 or not, but in other words, there's a lot of things that happened in the legislature this year that there's planning money for the communication union districts, the public service departments get money to do uh, hire a new person to help communication union districts, uh, electric utility money is in there, they're doing their own study, they're going to give grants to electric utilities. There's some overlapping stuff in that legislation. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how it all sugars out, but we made a list of it and um, the you know trying to get a handle on that. Uh, Ken is drafting a how do we look how do we possibly look at the integration of some of the things we need to be looking at as these studies go forward, and hopefully we'll have some information for the whole board to to ponder. Um, yeah, no, there's quite a bit <laughs> the, the the amount of information in 513. Got me. I don't know if it deal, did 513 deal with Orca. No, no, I don't think so. Okay, uh, there's a lot of stuff on Orca during those hearings in the mm -hmm. finance committee. 
Senate Finance Committee. Um, the feasibility study that we're you know, going to be get, hopefully get money to do, we're going to start developing a scope of work. We got sort of a skeleton. We've seen 17, pre uh, 15 presentations. We sort of know what the content typically is, but we'd like to start drafting what an RFP content would contain so we can actually do the business planning, feasibility planning. Um, service priorities, you know that's something that's come up discussion here a couple times. We think we're the committee that should be working on that, but anyway, we're going to come up with some ideas on presenting to the board, you know, how do you choose where deployment happens in some sequence. Um, unless somebody here says, no, that's not a business development function. So we won't do it. Dave, my one thing on that is, how can we possibly do that before we've done any kind of feasibility work? Well, it would be, but I think it, we need to have that framed in the feasibility study. Well, right. That's I'm looking, as somebody who sits on the board and, you know, be, you know, I would vote against Cabot if it made sense, but <laughs> I'm going to be parochial for stuff, human nature, right? And so you look at it from a perspective until we have information that you would get. Correct. From a body, it's going to be very difficult. And there's multiple kinds of information right. that factor into that. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. But it's something I know if we don't address it in, in the study, the feasibility study, or you know, looking at the results right. of we surveys, or whatever, you know, or where the, where's financing coming? I mean, there's the, you know, it's a whole. Anyway, so that's something that the committee thought it had to deal with. Um, marketing. And I know we have, <laughs> I don't know, is there, there's, I'm out of turn on this one, but is the Cabot $500 targeted towards what? No, we can use it for marketing. Because I think we need to get a designer, oh, a logo and, and, and material, just oh, yeah. simple stuff. We can use it, as long, it just has to be invoiceable. Okay. Well, anyway, I think the web committee ought to work on that with, <laughs> it's $500 there. Right? Well, I know we'd have to get the board to approve the expenditure, but I'm just saying, you're not having a standard identity and, and all that is sort of hurting us a little bit, I think. Do we dislike the current logo? Yeah, it's a little... <laughs> okay, I won't go there. But in terms of color, to me, design standards include color, logo, um, fonts, all those things that are standard, I forget what it's called, the design, you probably know the terminology for that. For a Geo Cities look. <laughs> and and uh, El uh, Elliot had some of that yeah. started last year yeah. in terms of yep. color, color he's gone. and whatnot. <laughs> he was talking about oranges. <laughs> so, anyway, so there's that that the committee has been uh, grappling with. Jared had something. I have just a question. Do you have access to any of that? Because I didn't get it from him. The, co the, the, the color scheme? It, it was an, an email back and forth. It was a discussion at one of these business development meetings. I got, I got a clip art of the a tra with transparent background of the logo from it. So I got that. Right. <laughs> anyway, but I think that that's something that I think we ought to start to focus on as we get to be a real entity. So, uh, uh, in that regard, would you bring a specific proposal yes. to us uh, for the next, next meeting? meeting? Yep. Yeah, thanks. Oh. And budgeting. We're not, you know, I think our role in budgeting, and since this came up at the last meeting and I wasn't totally following it last time, the committee will develop our budget needs to submit to the executive committee as opposed to trying to us being responsible for anything more than we want to take on. Um, and the community survey. Uh, it's been you know, ready for four months and we sort of had to go slow on rolling it out. The committee agreed that we would do the pilot testing of the survey in Callis and I'll put it out on Front Porch Forum tomorrow and we'll see what happens. Um, that way. The other thing is I need to, as you'll notice on the web map that you get tonight and the survey, it's all on Stone Environmental server and our license with Esri. I have no idea what the demand is going to be in terms of credit. It, the way the software works, it's all credit driven. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens with the survey. Mm -hmm. um, and I can report back on that in case it comes, <laughs> it blows up my office's um, Jerry. license. Mm -hmm. David. What, ex what exactly do you mean by credit? Do you mean there might be additional costs to Stone Environmental for handling the traffic? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, the way the license works is you know, you use as credits when people do things with your site. And it's pretty minimal. But I have never seen, you know, if I get 10,000 replies to the survey, I'm curious as to what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, so it, it, could, it could incur a, a fee, a yes. thousand dollar fee or something. Yeah, it probably won't be more than that, but anyway, yeah, it could be in there. So could you ask Stone if they'd be willing to do yes. that as an in yeah. kind? Yeah, thanks. It may get out of the, at some point out of the in kind, but, um, and then the last thing the committee is going to try to do is formalize its meeting so that they're, the Thursday, two weeks before the full board meeting because sometimes the board meeting falls on. <laughs> it's a very odd thing. I can't schedule it as a calendar of recurring event. So we're going to do that for the next year. So that's the report from the any other questions for the business development committee. Uh, so the question is that I've had is asked me is so what's the value proposition for the towns that already have service? So I'm from Barry City. Yes. We have the spectrum. And so, can I let Michael Brandbaum answer that? <laughs> no. So, so I, having having talked with the development folks in Barry City, and Montpelier for that matter, um, you're going to be probably late in the in the equation. There is still a demand among business and yeah. r residential exactly. folks to um, upgrade from um, from cable. And it's a it's a pretty substantial upgrade, and people um, may not like save lots and lots of money for using like EC fibers rates. But on the other hand, they get local tech support. They know it's a we're a not for profit entity, um, and our speeds are going to be symmetric. Mm -hmm. um, those are all, and we respect net neutrality. Not that we've had a policy for that, but we also don't collect your data, all these sorts of things. There's intangibles beyond the speed and the cost that I think will drive a number, a larger number of people to us than would than another um, for-profit entity coming onto the market and offering something similar. So okay. and I had communication with the city of Montpelier's development uh, person who really felt that there are a lot of small businesses to medium-sized businesses in Montpelier who really are looking for a venue to buy high-speed internet. But other than that, I don't have a lot of, I have, you know, the survey is they're intended for residential, but we're also going to do a survey of businesses as well. Okay. And, 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 and EC Fiber's experience <coughs> with building, with overbuilding fiber to the, to the premises in places that have cable is they get about a 17% take rate. Mm -hmm. So, which is about half of what it is in DSL only areas. Right. But the, the demand is there. The, the density is clearly, clearly there. Um, we just haven't sat down to try to build out the, the business model that would make that work reasonably well. There's some other, there's some competition issues there too that get, can get pretty ugly pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, I'm Ken and I'm a resident of Montpelier. And one of the things that strikes me is the amount that I pay for my current service is very, very, very high. And, uh -huh. any and, and we have, there is no alternative. So many of the residents that I speak with about internet connections would love to have long term. And yeah, we got density. So we got density. We got density. We're down. So we might not get 17 percent like AC Fiber does, because they're in particular smallish towns. Um, in Barry Montpelier, we might get 10 percent. But 10 percent of 8,000 residents, that's a good number for our CUD, and that's the reason. We well, it depends upon how concentrated they are. If they're really dispersed, maybe not so right. big. Right. Although there are so many people really not happy with Comcast and not really with it, there would probably be a much higher number than one suspects. Mm -hmm. And is it contemplated to offer TV service as well? <laughs> this, 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 this conversation ha has happened, and that, and it's, it's rather fraught. It is. Um, yeah. So, uh, giving people strong suggestions of set-top boxes and services they might be able to stream really effectively with their, you know, hundred megabit symmetric. That's probably a better angle than saying well, there's, that. There's the middle ground too. Yes. There's, there's all these. Latest just come out IPTV sort of solutions. Yes, some of them are very Pretty attractive. Good. That's right. We should consider that, but we're not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, what CV Fiber is doing is they're overbuilding, like in Montpelier and in Barry. But traditionally, overbuilds capture at least twenty percent of the population, which is not a bad story. Right. 
Right, but that's, but that's where the feasibility study comes in to well, give us yeah. some sense of what the actual numbers are. We know you see fibers numbers, but Michael's right, the demographics are uh, rather different. Yeah. And Siobhan? One of the things that will play well in Montpelier is it's a local artisanal source for their internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Can we call this the artisanal <laughs> internet? <laughs> <laughs> um, if they're in, that's probably not going to play. So. No, no. But um, one of the things that at least I'm rushing for as part of our goal here is to help bridge the tech divide between the classes in the state because we've got a huge tech gap there. Yes. And that might be better at Barry City because it'll make it more, my, I've got a lot of, I've got all these dreams, I've got hopes and dreams about what, what I'm hoping that we can do. One of the things is possibly an offset fund that people can contribute into to help offset startup costs for people who can't afford it. That kind of thing. That a company like Consolidated is never going to All right. And so, that's the Comcast actually has. Well, they're forced into it. True. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's just some other possibilities. Farm to premises internet. One other item that came out of this discussion for the web is a calendar, a monthly calendar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions mm -hmm. for me? Other members of the committee? Thank Thanks, you. David. All right, um, insurance options, Josh. Yeah, um, so. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are we going to vote on members? Or does that come later? Well, in, on, the, on the committee? Yeah. Process question. Are all the members that we already have on the committee? We don't know. Like, Jared doesn't know if he is appointed to the committee or not. Was it, do you remember the, seeing that in minutes? I'd have to look back through the minutes. I knew I had seen Jeremy in the March minutes. That's why right. I sent that to you. So um, what I, I guess I'd like to make a motion for, cause for clarification that Jeremy, I mean, Jared Thomas, um, I don't even know if Michael and David uh, were ever yeah. formally appointed. Hold on. Okay. We did. Boy, back. No. <laughs> no, I think you showed up at the meeting. <laughs> and that's sort of been how it's been going. Yeah, we have voted people on the um, Yeah, we have voted people on before. Um, well, the last meeting we said the business, the finance and business development committees will seek to appoint new members at the next meeting. So, um, I think it would be a yeah. good idea to vote on appointing people, but maybe we should get that all together and then so, vote on all the committees so, next time. Or, or, or if you want business development committee, we can just say here are the people who are on yep. them. Anybody who's not listed in that list or is not. So I'm going to make a motion that's Jerry Diamantidis, Diamantidis, Diamantidis <laughs> David Healy, Dan Jones, Ken Jones, Michael Bandbaum, Jared Thomas, Skip Lindsay, and Jeremy Matt. Matt. Be on the Business Development Committee. I have a second. I'll second that. Any discussion? Yeah. What's that? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right, not hearing any further discussion. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Abstaining. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank Super. you. Thank Any you. anything else? Um, Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, I'm glad you grabbed it. Now, Josh, you were saying something. Yes. Uh, Josh Berry Town. Uh, in our last meeting, we had a discussion in regards to insurance that we're going to need to um, have for grant reasons. Um, and somebody in that last meeting had brought up the possibility of looking at captive insurance. And I, I have some background in captive insurance, uh, loosely, I will say. Um, and so I decided to just look into it a little deeper uh, to see what possible options that we might have for that. Um, starting our own captive at this point, um, if any of you know about captives, it, it's not feasible. Um, you would need uh, a quarter of the insurance that we were hoping to acquire down as, as, as a capital start to um, 
essentially create your your captive insurance agency, and then there it, it would, you would also have a required feasibility study that would need to be done in order to do that, and then there are of course uh, management fees that would go back to the captive management firm to manage that captive for you. I can see that uh, captive insurance could potentially be beneficial for us once we're an established organization. But right now, creating our own captive is not feasible. However, um, I am also aware of some other captives that are already formed that potentially could help us, one of them being um, a captive by the name of County Reinsurance Limited. They're out of the Carolinas. Um, their name, County, um, kind of speaks to a lot of what they do. Um, so they insure counties and they give the exact types of insurances that we're looking for. Um, and I knew that going in and I was actually very familiar with this particular captive. Um, and But I was hoping that they might actually even branch out into municipalities. Um, they do not. So I was uh, I was able to affirm that they're not going to be able to help, this, help us with that. Um, that doesn't shut down <coughs> captives as, as an option for us. There's also such a thing as called rent a captives. <laughs> I can believe it. I can believe it. But it's it. essentially a, a more feasible way for, for organizations yeah. as small as ours and with a bank account like ours uh, to, to possibly be a, be a part of. I'm still waiting on some numbers to come back from that on, on, on possibilities, but I really think that we're we, we're definitely going to be in a situation where we're going to have to, sh you know, shop this with, you know, typical, um, you know, and you know, commercial insurance companies. Susan, as a municipal, aren't we qualified for Vermont League of Cities and Towns well, Insurance? Well, that's a really good point. Um, in, in our last meeting, um, it was brought up, and Jeremy had brought up. But essentially, we were say it nicely. We we're essentially kind of like no. shut down from the leagues mm -hmm. and towns. So that's not going to happen. Um, we can certainly propose it to them, and that was an option that was given to us by Fred Tink, but um, that's more than likely not going to pass and will not be able to be insured by the And he, pre he presented it to their board, and they voted it down. Yeah, there you go. So on his recommendation, they voted it down. I actually am very familiar with Fred Tink, so I actually uh, knew that going into that. So yeah, that's not going to happen. So we do need to find our own insurance, especially if, if it's something that we need to procure in order to, you know, accept these grants. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you all want me to, while I'm investigating uh, this captive insurance thing, I don't know if you want me to, if there's specific commercial insurance agencies that you want me to look through as well, I would be happy to do that. So um, I'd like you to, if you could reach out to ValleyNet and find out who they use. That was explicitly suggested to us by the league. Okay. Um, and it's an insurance company that already knows um, that particular kind of organizational structure and what they're hoping to do. And uh, it's not super cheap, but it's at least at least available. And okay. it's and they've had, as, as yeah. I understand it, they've yeah. had an organization so if you could find out find out that landscape of, of what's required for that then too um, you know we can then go find it or if, if somebody else knows a specific insurance provider and they can suggest to um, suggest to Josh that would be helpful but if, yeah I, I personally would love to see you spearheading this and bringing us some you know proposals by the next meeting if you can yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, at the last meeting, this did come up, and, and I, I volunteered to call up uh, EC Fiber. Okay. Oh, and so they have a new manager there, and who had just started like not even a month ago, and uh, so he was unaware that you know um, you should do things by the book. So he just went and asked, and uh, <laughs> so he, he the people that they use is uh, is called. Telcom Insurance Company um, out of uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, and um, gave me the name of the account manager and the phone numbers and email and uh, et cetera. So, if anybody wants that, that uh, I would like that. Is there anybody so you can just pass it? it right around? Here. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I have it on paper. And uh, and if you want more information, Chris was really helpful uh, from EC Fiber and. Uh, so I think he wants it. He just passed that around. I think that, that he'd be. 
because he's new, you know, um, let's burn him out quick. <laughs> so, so I, my experience with the folks down at uh, EC Fiber and ValleyNet is that regardless of who I talk to there, they're always happy and don't really necessarily care about going by the book. So yeah. I'm glad to hear that Chris is <laughs> continuing that, that tradition of just handing us information that yeah. we ask for. I think that was stamped on the back of the yeah. 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 That's mm -hmm. great. Michael? Thank you. So, so he, he, was, uh, um, he was former commissioner of Permanent public service. Chris was. Yeah, I didn't know. Well, oh, Chris Rackham. So I do too. I don't know. Oh, Chris Rackham. Yeah. He, he was uh, great. He I was, was charged great. last meeting to bring in insurance information that I had. Okay. And I brought um, something from Travelers, which I'll share with you. Okay. And also the company I'm dealing with is Unitel that specializes in telecom. So I'll give you that information as well. Thank you. Appreciate because we can't. Um, actually, Chris I got an email from. What are you talking about? from the state of Vermont oh, yeah. um, asking us like so how's that timeline going? It's like well we haven't even accepted the grant yet so it's yeah. a bit early to be talking about the timeline and I said I let them know about the USDA grant and these sorts of things but I said we can't even comply with your insurance requirements yet let's get this down once we can do that we'll hopefully be able to say yes and spend some money at the next meeting uh, go get that insurance policy and move on from there. Okay. Anything else about uh, insurance? I know, well, one thing I, I remember working with some subcontractors that I've dealt with over the years who on a specific project or grant can buy a policy just for that grant. Mm -hmm. So since we're not really an operational utility yet, I hate to spend more money than we need to. Mm -hmm. So I'll look into that and get back to you. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, review of back burner items, committee assignments, and membership. Are there any other committee changes that need to happen? Um, we had talked briefly last meeting, um, so Bob Klein was on the Finance Committee and he is no longer the delegate or alternate for East Montpelier, so, um, and I did email him to see if he was still interested in being on the committee and I haven't heard back, so um, Finance could probably use some more people. Okay. So this is a, a new uh, member training, but what are the different committees and how do people get on committees? Good how are they selected to be, to, before they can be appointed, they have to be nominated, I suppose. Video selected. three. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so this, uh, th this actually came up in the, um, in the meeting from April. The minutes of which I just finished today. Um, so yeah, so we have we have three committees: business development committee, the finance committee, and the policy committee. The policy committee handles the policies. Business development handles the things that we were hearing um, before and is um, summarized more, um, much better by what David presented today than anything else I think that we've had in the past. And then the finance committee, which is more um, oriented around um, financial. Um, procedures and the bank account, um, uh, things like uh, like purchase orders, um, kind of li liaising with uh, with Becca on the treasurer stuff, and that's it's really those three. And then the sort of uh, the executive committee, which is just um, ex officio chair, vice chair, and uh, treasurer. And, and, and I suspect as we start growing as an organization, you know, there'll be other committees, like technical committees and things like that, that'll, that'll just start to come you know, out of the woodwork as sure. we need them. So. And yeah, and so if, if at any sure. point people think that there's some other uh, work that needs to be done that doesn't fit within the, the purview of an existing committee, we can, we can spin one up, that's fine. Um, realize though that these committee meetings all also have to abide by the uh, open meetings law. So if you have six people on a committee, um, you know, three constitutes a quorum. And if you're just like sitting and having a having a pint down at Applebee's or whatever, the the, the three of you, um, that technically is a meeting that would have to be warned. So. Um, but if we talk it out loud, we're including the public, right? <laughs> so, yes, but, it's, but you would have you to warn it. If you ask your server if they have any public comments. Yeah. There are no Vermont statutes that prohibit drinking at public meetings. I don't think there is. I might have heard. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, 
Dur and during the last sure meeting, it, it was midnight in Unless Germany it's for sure me. It's so. it's <laughs> elementary schools might not be the best place. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is true. Okay. So the um, the back burner items that I currently have um, on the back burner, interest from Waterbury and Duxbury. I've not heard anything from anybody over there. I even reached out to their um, to Waterbury's uh, economic development person, and she did not respond to me yet. Did you have something? Yeah, related to the expansion, having seen uh, Kingdom Fibers line and seeing that it is in Hardwick, is there any interest in us looking at Hardwick to connect to the state line? I don't understand the question. The state's fiber line that goes to Hardwick. Right. Should we be entertaining trying to get Hardwick to become part of CV Fiber? Would it be any advantage for us? Would it be any I don't know. I'm a personal friend of the town manager and I'll ask them. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's just one of those things. I saw the line I'm saying. I mean, we, we, are, in, we are in Hardwick. You are in Hardwick? Yeah. Okay, so that's Kingdom Fiber. Yeah. Okay. So for the, the new folks that might not know you, do you want to give a quick blurb about Kingdom Fiber so that they understand the uh, possible conflicts involved like we did last year? Okay, well, um, for starters, um, I'm a one man CUD. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so it's a for-profit company serving the Northeast Kingdom based mainly on um, long-term leasing, it's called an IOU, of state fiber with building out um, laterals off of that as it passes through 22 different towns. Um, and. So it's a startup we're operating. We're really at the beginning. We've been working on it for five years, but we're just turning up customers finally. Um, and um, I'm happy to cooperate with CV Fiber in every way, including the potential of being possibly in some form an operator. Um, so that's where a conflict of interest might arise. If we ever get to discussions of that sort of topic, which, which case I would refuse myself in those discussions. Is that sort of what you were looking yep. for? Yep. Okay. Just wanted to make sure everybody kind of understood the landscape. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, expansion into other towns. You know, we had previously talked about Waterbury, Duxbury, um, conceivably Stowe, and Washington. I think those were the, the ones that we were otherwise considering. I haven't done any sort of outreach to them. I haven't done um, any other follow-up except that contact to Waterbury about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, does the other issue that comes up based on you know, Washington Electric Co-op's interest and actually looking at all 41 towns that, that are in mm -hmm. WEC, whether that ought to be, as they proceed with the, their feasibility study and the costing thing, is that something we, we should probably keep in mind, mm -hmm. in my opinion? Okay. I think they're going to see us as their pilot study. Because they're not going to do 41 towns. No, they're like not. That, right? no. And so we're going to do a few towns at the beginning of one town or half a town or whatever, and we're going to grow, and they're going to feed into that. And as, as they can, you know, they will have the capability of raising a lot of money quickly. Yeah. And so, who knows? But I, they're risk averse, and, they're, yes. and they would love for us to take the risks improve things for them. So I think that's a partnership. typically how it no, it's a partnership. As a partner. Okay, so it doesn't sound like we need to assign any more people to um, committees or tackle any back burner items. Um, all right. So, move. Yeah. so we just, you went over the rules of procedure and you said something about signing them. Or are we supposed to adopt them? Are we... <coughs> Are you going to have people sign them? I was, I, changes to them? I was going to have this be first read, and, I, I, and I've, already did, I've already found some things that I need to change that are just okay. minor corrections. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to take a, a little bit longer and give me some feedback if there's anything that you need to change or add or otherwise, I don't want to just kind of lay it on you a couple days in advance and then, then adopt it. We'll, we'll adopt it for in our July meeting. Okay. I would recommend that we adopt it tonight. I think the changes that we probably found are minor, and unless there's discussions of concern about this document, we already 
passed once. Maybe we should consider amending the copy you sent around with those minor changes that you've just identified in your mind and you can share them with us and we can dispense with it for next meeting. We, we spent a large amount of the first year figuring that stuff out. We don't need to rehash all that work. Yeah. Are the changes you're recommending housekeeping changes or are there major changes? I mean, I've, I've read it. I don't know how many other people have read it. but Yeah, there was uh, the one the one housekeeping change that I made was under agendas. There's a reference to Central Vermont Internet. I just wanted to strike that, make that CV fiber. Right. And then the other question was about um, additions to or changes to the agenda. Um, the way we've been doing it has not been according to the rules of procedure. I've been doing it more like we do it at the Berlin Select Board, which is kind of everybody's kind of like stares at each other and nods in <laughs> agreement. And if nobody pipes up, then they get added to the added to the agenda or removed from the agenda. Um, so we can leave that in there and just we because can actually you, your, your agenda does not follow uh, Robert's rules of order. But I can talk to you about that. No, 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 and and we are, and there's no, there's actually no mention here that we um, are adopting Robert's Rules of Order. It is in the statute that un unless we adopt policies otherwise, mm -hmm. we're not following Robert's Rules of Order exactly. So, for example, the um, informal discussion of an agenda item shall be permitted while no motion is pending. That's not Robert's Rules. Um, however, it works for a, a much more um, colloquial. Mm -hmm comfortable meeting <laughs> rather than being slaves to the format of Robert's Rules, which I have been, unfortunately, part of organizations that take that really, really seriously. For that, for that um, amending the agenda, could you just add or by consensus? Here, here's what I'm going to do. I'll just start running the meetings according to these policies starting the next meeting. Okay. So they have been adopted. <laughs> uh, <coughs> that, so, I, will, I will hear that as a motion from uh, m m Mr. M m Mr. Healy, Second. seconded by Dan Jones, that we adopt the rules of procedure with the <coughs> Central Vermont Internet struck on page three and replaced with CV fiber. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor. Aye. Aye. Well then. Thank you, Michael. So we don't have to sign them, right? I mean, you, you were just going to have us do that so that we, you know, to hold us accountable. We, sh we should sign them. Oh, They're well, different yeah. numbers. We just vote on it. Okay. So, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to pass it around. I'm going to grab a pen. <coughs> choose not to actually. Don't have a pen. Thank you. I'm going to pass this around. If you don't want to sign it out of principle, <laughs> there's, there's a good reason to sign it right? because of some history. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which, oh, yeah. yeah, which should m maybe go into the informal so section of the for eight with limited distribution. Training number five. My subscription only. We got more. Orange. Yep, so moving on to uh, the approval of the April 9th and May 14th meeting minutes. Um, I sent you the April 9th meeting minutes via email probably a half an hour before this meeting started because uh, procrastinator supreme. So I, I, would, I would not be offended if you wanted to decide to hold this off until the next meeting, although <clears throat> given the um, people wanting to get things uh, out of the way, I'm These are the May ones. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure I should vote or move the May the May meeting minutes, given that I was only there for the first hour. <laughs> I move to approve the May meeting minutes. Just for quietly. Okay. So moved and seconded. Who was the second? Second. Tom. Okay. No place to sign on the May one. No, no, no we're, we're not going to sign the minutes. We're just going to sign the policy that's coming around. Um, so April, uh, or sorry, the, the May 14th meeting minutes. Any further discussion about the, the May meeting minutes? Okay, hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. I'm abstaining. 
Okay, May 14th meeting minutes are approved. Do we want to sit on the April 9th or chew on them for a bit? Well, the only people that can vote on them in April and the people that are here in April. This is true. Right. Is there a quorum? Is there people from April? Should be. Um, let's see. Michael, Phil, Bob Burley's not here. Andy's here. I'm here. David's here. Tom's here. Skip is not. Jerry's here. John's here. Yeah, yeah, we have enough. So I'm going to move that we approve the April 9th, 2019 meeting minutes as presented. Second. Okay. Seconded by Andy Gilbert, I guess. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And probably a handful of abstentions. Abstention. One, two, three, and several. Yeah. Okay. Uh, round table. I just want to, the only thing I want to say is that I want to thank everybody who helped get H513 through the legislature this session. Um, we, I don't think it's been signed yet. I, I have an I have an update. I, I'll, okay. I'll give. But anyway, I just want I know a lot of people put time into going to the legislature and preparing materials for the legislature, and it uh, I think it paid off. So. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody. No, I was going to say I don't steal this pen. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it. I didn't like put it in my purse. <laughs> You're on the top. I'll pass this time. I guess I'll pass. Um, I just want to say that. Um, I, I reached out to the town of Barry just to see if um, our, our municipality <coughs> itself had any monies uh, that they would be willing to offer to organizations and things like that. And, and our town does not do that, but we do offer, our town offers loans and things like that. So I um, just wanted to make that known that, that, I did, that I did reach out to the town to see if there's any monies available that we might be able to acquire, but there's not. Thanks. Um, just really briefly, I've on a number of occasions recently been reminded of how poor our options are for good quality internet here. Uh, I particularly work with businesses, so I'm very much looking forward to moving this process forward. Are so you talking about the, the big outage last week? Oh, God. Uh, that was part of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're familiar with it. That, I, I was off that day, and that was the biggest headache of my life. Yeah, so whose failed router was it? Uh, consolidated in Burlington. And it affected Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. So when they do it, when they blow it, they blow it really good. Oh, that's why I get my thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a little aside, not that I can know too much about that, I get to watch that happen in real time. As long as my internet's still working. <laughs> I actually, I have monitors on most of CCI sites. Um, so, um, I, one thing that more for me is, A, I wanted to offer, I mean, I can help you a little bit with the website from a technical perspective if you'd like. Um, I think the other thing that we got to start focusing on is development, um, meaning money. Um, and I, you know, I say that, it's like that in my volunteering myself, but um, you know, back to the, you know, some of what you're talking about. But I think some of it goes hand in hand with, we kind of got to get that website presence a little better, and we got to think about Materials. really putting pressure on ourselves for development. Um, that's just... Um, I just wanted to express my appreciation for what the policy, policy committee has drafted with this uh, uh, grant policy. I think it's a good first step, and you know, I don't know much of anything on the technological side of things. You all have much greater wealth of knowledge than I do. I'm just a writer, but if I can be of any help whatsoever, I would love to help. Susan Gardner Woodbury, um, our town appropriations are requests are due in by before December for a March meeting, and I I'm going to appeal to the town through appropriation of $500 for CD Fiber. Um, I also recommend that this committee or form um, partnership with local businesses and also that if we can join the Chamber of Commerce, Central Vermont Chamber of Commerce, I think that would be an ideal place for us to advertise for partnerships. 
especially with businesses. So as, a, as just a point of information, um, it would be illegal for the town of Woodbury to give us a $500 appropriation. In it's reason? Why? Because we're a municipal, the communications union district statute says that a town may not use its taxing capacity to fund any of our operations. Really? Yep. Yeah, really. So, <laughs> but related so to that. So how can we change that? <laughs> change, change statute or, or we or we read a charter. It was reaffirmed it was in the latest it legislation. It was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It was reaffirmed. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, but the, the option of that is getting every one of our municipalities to buy CV Fiber right. as its provider. Yeah, so if the town office wanted to hook up, wanted to commit, commit or, to the, yeah. or wanted to contract with CV yes. Fiber to build something as a project, like you might contract with a construction company to do some new paving or something, mm -hmm. um, that's possible. But isn't that why we're here at the table to do this with you? Yes, but the town can't simply write us a check unless we're doing a pro unless we're doing a project For that we we had, like um, that involves one pair. Yeah, town. yeah. So okay. yeah, you could hi hire us to do something, but you can't simply write us a check as an appropriation right. like you would That's to. That's good to know. How are we to buy the money from Cabot from a nonprofit? Yeah, okay. that's their it's development it's or the <laughs> development arm. Cool. It's just so, cool. uh, tangential to what Susan is bringing up. So towns, many towns ran fiber alarm cable, mm -hmm. and the towns control that space on the poles. Mm -hmm. And I've been successful in the past in getting towns to let us use that space. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to your towns and find out, does your town have fire alarm cable? That would be mm -hmm. the first question. And the second is, when would they allow uh, that to be used? Do you have a map of that? Dark fiber? Uh, no. So it's, it's town by town, you know, as to whether they ran fire alarm cable. You have to find out from the town where those fire alarm cables go because they don't necessarily go over the whole town. Right, but do you, but do you know for Barry City where, where that stuff lives? No. I'll be finding that out. <laughs> yes, that, that would that would be great because having knowing where that yeah. where that landscape is municipal owned dark fiber. But no, no, the fire alarm cable is copper. This it's goes back decades. Yeah. But to using the line. But using the space hang, to put even the fire cable the line. without oh. having to pay for make ready. Oh, uh, right, so call it yeah. <laughs> say we're upgrading. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, that's, a, that's a really, really good idea. So it's the real idea. estate, yes. it's not the cable. So, and, but those, al and those alarms are not being used. In most cases, they're obsolete. Yeah, and, you know, huh. We've called Florida up at Newport. Many, many years ago, the local cable company saved some of its dark fibers for the fire department up there to use. And we were very successful to do that. Very interesting. <laughs> the question that came up from uh, for me is that in the business development stuff is we're actually working in kind of two areas that may need to be subdivided at some point. There is, uh, we'll call it the business image, the the whole idea of what is the offering, what is the uh, position development, you know, like surveying the, uh, the other stuff. And the other, there's this whole other like, grant activity, which is it business, is it, you know, is there a funding committee, is there a finance committee, something, should that be, you know, how is that being handled? And it seems a little bit questionable in how we're handling it right now. I don't have a specific, uh, Recommendation. I'm just uh, saying that I believe this is something we got to start looking at because we're, uh, as we grow, that's going to be forcing the uh, too much work on one small pity. Okay, so maybe if you uh, next time you guys have have your meeting, I would just say uh, if you can come up with a proposal how you would like to <coughs> spread the love or divide the love or whatever, <laughs> or if the finance committee Keep needs to up. take over some elements of that, uh, bring the recommendation. I, I don't think you'll find probably a lot of. Um, reluctance here. What do you think, Jeremy? Anything? No, pass. Jer Jerry? Well, just going back to to Dan's point, we we did make this we made a uh, a split between finance and business development, where the going out and getting the money went to business development, and the bank accounts and 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 the handling of the money was going to be with the finance working more with the with the treasurer. So that, that's where we made the line. But it, it may be the case that, you know, a separate grant writing team Capitalization committee. Might be I don't know. <laughs> but that's what yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's you. Oh, um, speaking of what Greg said about the uh, fire alarm cables, um, so getting rid of make ready is really important. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you don't get rid of pull rent when you share space. And that's something I'd like to see changed. Um, it's something I want to propose to the PUC or maybe the Department of Public Service first to see if we can change the pole tariff so that when you overlash on another cable, you don't have to pay full rent <laughs> to the pole owners when you're not increasing the load on the poles, etc. cetera. So that, that's just an interesting thing. Um, and to David, there's more of kingdom fiber you need to put on the map. Okay. Yep. John. Uh, I just want to say that I've been on a lot of uh, a lot of committees, and this one is by far the best run. Um, so, thanks, thanks to all the three of you. Thanks, Phil. That was recorded. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else you said was also recorded. <laughs> right. And Which I stand behind good. every word I said. Okay. okay. I'm good. Um, so I heard back, um, not with any results, but um, we are being scored by uh, rural, the rural development folks on our grant. So we will hopefully know soonish. So they're tallying up those points. There was something. There's some documentation that was missing in our packet, and they gave us a couple days to catch back up and provide that documentation. Um, and so hopefully that means that they're nearing the end. Um, H513 was passed by the House and the Senate by uh, insanely overwhelming margins. And the most recent version, uh, contrary to the um, VT Digger article, allows uh, for loans up to $4 million. So. Um, and just to remind all of you, ValleyNet has, has approached us about them essentially putting together the business plan and the loan paperwork and everything to get the, to, to go after that $4 million and build on, on our southern towns in, to interconnect with their, ex, with the existing network, um, with EC Fiber's existing network. So um, it's not been signed by the governor yet. Um, there's a lot of really interesting um, parts of it. I think for us, the biggest one, though, is that Vita loan, which could mean that we're building in Roxbury, Northfield, Williamstown as soon as next but year. But they only authorized $10 million, right? And the maximum loan is $4 million. Right. Right. So it's going to go fast. It will go fast. So it'll be, it'll be essentially, <laughs> the, essentially the first two, two or three uh, entities to get to the feeding trough are going to be... Yeah are going to be emptying it, which is which is fine because we're ready, we're poised to go, and it, it could not have been passed at a better time. Can you explain, though, I, I keep hearing about it being passed, but if, 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 you, if you do a search, it seems the House bill passed at the end of March, and then you don't hear about it. It's there. So, so it passed in the Senate definitively. And the final version's on the way. So, so, so here's what happened. The, the, the House passed their version, which was not very much like, well, it's, it, it resembled the Senate version. It went to the Senate. Senate finance made a lot of really good improvements mm -hmm. and changed a couple things. And then it went back to the House for, um, conference. for essentially a conference committee, but they just, they just accepted it without sending it to a conference committee. It was accepted, and now it's waiting to be, I don't remember the name of the process, but I don't even know if it's been communicated to the governor's office yet. Uh, once it gets to the governor's office, I think there's five days, 48 hours, something like that, for him to sign it or let it be um, automatically passed into law or to veto it. He's going to make hay with it. <laughs> no, I, I, I understand. I, I, I haven't seen any, any inv invites to the press release or anything like that but, <laughs> or the press conference. But I expect that's going to happen. Hopefully soon, and the sooner the better, because the sooner that that gets passed, a lot of those part, a lot of those things go into effect on passage, and as soon as Vita knows that that's something that they have to get underway, then the sooner they're going to be able to get their their stuff going, and the sooner that we'll be able to apply for it. So, are there things that we can be thinking about doing or getting prepared to do? So we can jump on as quick as possible if it is sort of a first come first serve type. That's what that USDA grant is was supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. I mean, a big way is to get us positioned 
for that next for that next mm -hmm. brand. Sure. It's uh, everything seems to be moving in slow motion, but I guess it's all moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I have as a, a to-do list item for me to talk to ValleyNet and find out what our next step is with them and get something reasonably concrete. Now that the bill is going to pass, um, finding out what our next step with them is and be able to bring something to you all and be able to say yay or nay or make some changes, but it, essentially to be able to move forward and be ready to pull that trigger as soon as Vita's ready to accept applications will be, will be their first day. And uh, why is the necessity to have fiber uh, valley net? Um, because they're offering to essentially use their business model, do all the work, um, and be our operator for the first three years or so. And they've already done it. They're already, and they are literally already doing it. They have the office, they have the technicians. Right. Um, our startup costs for them would be, and, and consequently for us, would be really low. It, it would. It's right at this moment. It's, it's the cheapest option, and we would be able to immediately start serving customers. And so, years of serving customers, then, um, then we can transition into the municipal bond market, where we can start going after revenue bonds. And then we sort of put on our, you know, um, adult pants, and we right. can start doing things on on our own. Then. Well, we don't have a technical proposal from them. So going back to you, sir, what, what, what you just brought up about why Valley We don't have a technical proposal that hasn't been brought to the board. There's, there have been preliminary discussions, and there are lots of reasons, good reasons, to follow through on those discussions. Mm -hmm. But it still has to come, come up to the board, and, right. and as Jeremy's trying to do, get this happen for the right time so that we can be on the top of the line. Right. If the board decides they want to. Something I said before about this, and that is that as much as we love EC Fiber and we appreciate them for all the reasons that Jeremy just laid out and advantages to us, they aren't necessarily the right way to go. And Technology if nice. we get in bed with them and their technical arrangement, then it probably behooves us to continue that way as we expand. It's really hard to have multiple platforms on one network and multiple um, modus operandi and so forth. So it's something that we very well may endorse, but we as a board have not really discussed it and we need to. Well, we need to understand how they do things and how that compares to some other options like um, Greg has tremendous experience running networks, and it's very different from the way they run their network. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that we need to do at some point before Due diligence. we just jump. That's okay. You meant it, Valley Fiber, not, not um, ValleyNet, not DC Fiber. They're the same thing. Valley same Valley same. Net is the operator of DC Fiber. It, the best type of operator. DC, DC Fiber is what we are. like what we are. Yeah. yeah so. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. You, you completely beat me to it. <laughs>